Okay, in this video I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to do a voiceover. And I previously uploaded this project, and I typically do music in my build videos, but I had a few requests to explain what I'm doing. And so in this version of the same video, I'm going to do a voiceover talking about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and the thought process involved with building something like this. This project was a custom design coffee table. It was not my design. It's an adaptation and frequently custom projects start this way. So the project began with a photo from another factory catalog. So this is the photo that I had to work with and I had to adapt my design based on this photo and the customer's specifications. So that's how I started this and First, I'm going to eat this very tasty turkey sandwich. I hope that doesn't bother anybody. I just made this sandwich, and boy, does it look good. Mmm. That was good. Mmm. These voiceovers are going to be great. Alright, so here we are at the beginning. And I actually didn't intend to record footage for this project, but later on I decided maybe it'll turn out to be something. So this is the beginning of the project. I'm selecting three wide planks to make the tabletop. And I've shown this process in other videos, so you could check that out. I'm going to do a half lap joinery to glue these together. And... Here, here they are glued together. And this is 8 quarter rough cut pine and I'm gonna get the rest of the parts out of these two boards and here I have them rough cut to the approximate size. I go about an eighth inch oversized to a quarter inch depending on how straight the wood is. And at, at this point I have it all milled there are actually three different sizes that I'm going to be working with. And so we're skipping ahead and I'm cutting the dados on the table saw. So this is going to be like a half lap interlocking joint. I'm going to do two passes on the dado blade. I had it set at about 13 sixteenths. And the frame members are inch and a half, so that's enough to hog out an inch and a half channel. So there are two different types of X's that are going to make the base. So I'm going to do four of one size and then two of another size. And so what I'm doing here is trying to get the fit to be just perfect. So I do a bunch of test cuts uh, on a test piece to make sure that I have it set up right and then I do the rest of the pieces and each piece gets the same exact cut which makes this process go faster uh, so here I am I'm gonna set up the cut to make the second size X and so the only precise measurement I need is the measurement of the angle and the piece is actually cut oversized it's about an inch oversized in length on each end and you'll see why I do it this way I'm actually not going to cut all of the joints individually I'm gonna make a template okay so this is the glue up I just need a little bit of glue on the bottom of this channel to attach these frames permanently together I'm doing a natural finish on these on this piece of furniture and that means I have to be really especially careful with how much glue I apply when I'm joining pieces together because if I have too much squeeze out it can smear all over the place and that can be a downer for the finish so I have to apply just the right amount of glue and minimize the squeeze out and if I can actually eliminate it altogether that's ideal you know these joints don't need to be glued at every possible surface, it just needs a little bit to lock it together and 
it's not really a structural thing. These X's basically serve as a decorative element, so that's its, real, its primary purpose. So here they are all glued up. There are four small X's and two larger X's at different angles. And so all of these X's are oversized. And here's the template. I'm using a piece of MDF to screw these blocks onto a template. And the blocks are just going to allow the X to line up in the same position. And I'm going to, I haven't marked with a pencil exactly where it is. So I have it centered on this piece. And I'm going to cut the X to the same exact dimensions as the template. And I'm attaching these toggle clamps to make the clamping go a little bit faster when I'm setting these up. So there's my template jig. That maybe took 10 minutes to build. And MDF probably wasn't the ideal substrate to use because there's a lot of friction on the edge. So you'll see I have this guide fence clamped onto my main fence. And there's a thin piece of wood on the bottom of the guide fence which rides under the overlapping X. So I'm using the substrate as a template to match the outside dimensions of the X. So there are multiple compound angle cuts to make the X and doing the template this way makes it a lot simpler so I don't actually have to measure any precise angles or lengths which are difficult to lay out um, and making a template to do this speeds up the operation and minimizes all the calculations and careful measurements. So I just have to calculate the angle of the X when I cut those dado slots and I have to calculate the size of the template to be very accurate uh, and then I have to line up the X to be centered on that template as close as possible. But that's the only careful measurements that I need to make. As some of you may know, I live life on the edge, like this block of wood. And you never know what's going to happen. So here's another view making those template cuts. And you can see how the X overlaps the guide fence. So here I am setting up a template. I actually recut the template to make the smaller size X. So I'm just setting it up the same way. And now I'm going to make the same type of cuts on the other X's. So if I was going to do this again, I would not use MDF as a substrate just because there's a lot more friction where I'm running that template against the guide fence. And the friction can cause the template to bind, uh, so I just had to be really slow and careful with it. But I would probably use plywood and sand the edges to make it run a little bit smoother. So here are four of those X's. I made like a little pattern to demonstrate its symmetry. And they are all nice and square and the same exact size. So here I'm making another template. This is, my, this is my oscillating drum sander. And so there's a little detail on the feet to make the base of this table. And so I'm cutting a profile to make another template to um, make this more mass producible. I'm, I'm taking my other template apart and making a third template using the same toggle clamps. And that's going to cut that little profile with a pattern cutting router bit. So 
So here's my pattern cutting bit. I believe it's a one inch by one inch pattern bit. So the ball bearing is on the bottom. And I'm going to be doing this in two passes. The first pass is going to cut halfway through. And then on the second pass, I'll use the previous cut as the pattern to complete the rest of the cut. So I'm basically just hogging out all this material with the router bit. And that probably wasn't the best idea. I probably should have done a preliminary cut either on the chop saw or a rough cut on the bandsaw so it didn't have to remove that much material but I decided just to hog it out maybe it was a little bit faster okay so here I'm completing the cut just freehanding it and using the previous cut as the guide So this is a method to make thicker router cuts on a template. You just do it in two or more passes. You'll notice that the uh, profile on the router makes a very smooth cut. I had a couple of questions about why I'm doing this step here on the bandsaw. Uh, it didn't really make sense, but basically what I'm doing is trying to rough up that surface this is actually a rustic finish uh, so I'm actually leaving the surfaces a little bit rough so I'm going to have some saw marks exposed and that's going to help um, take the stain a little bit uh, more, more aggressively sometimes the router bit will burnish the end grain of a piece of wood and that actually changes the properties of the surface so it doesn't accept stain the same way. So if it's a very smooth cut it'll show lighter color and stain so if I rough it up with some saw marks it'll take more stain and blend in better with the rest of the piece. So here I'm laying out just the uh, size, um, cutting the size to make those joining frame members and I'm cutting a templates piece first out of some scrap wood so I, I set the stop on the chop saw and do a test cut first and then my finish cut is determined after the test cut is approved so that's one method I use for trial and error measuring to make sure that accurate measurements don't get cut under size uh, which would waste material so all the parts are complete at this point. I'm ready to do the layout to line everything up and I'm going to pre-drill all the holes. I'm going to attach all of these pieces with screws. So there's no traditional joinery in this one. It's all going to be deck screws and a little bit of glue. And that's what's going to join this base together. So here's the start of the assembly process. What I'm going to be doing is marking the locations of where those X's are going to line up. And then I'm going to pre-drill a bunch of holes um, so that I get everything ready and I just have to screw it together and that will attach everything permanently. But it's important to pre-drill the holes uh, to make the assembly process go faster and to make sure that the screws go in straight. Uh, I don't want to have anything protruding out of the surface that's finished. Uh, so I just have to be sure to use the right size screw and pre-drill pre all the holes in the right locations. So it's actually fairly tedious uh, to lay out all of this. And I'm also using some dowels. Here I'm actually drilling holes for dowels I'm putting half inch dowels in the main frame members that are going to join at the corners. And this is actually going to be a template guide block using the same diameter drill bit, which is a half inch. So I'm just drilling a jig to drill all those dowel holes by hand. 
And here I'm just making a, a quick jig to line this up with the other frame members. So that takes about maybe 10 minutes to make a jig like this and it's going to drill a hole on the end grain in the right location and I have it sized to drill the correct depth as well. So you'll notice, you'll notice here I'm using two drills. The larger drill has a brad point bit and I use that to start the hole uh, because the brad point bit will start a hole more accurately but they require a lot more force and they're not as efficient in cutting a deep hole. Uh, so I use the brad point to start and then I finish the hole with a standard metal drilling bit which cuts a lot more aggressively and is a lot more efficient. The uh, metal drilling drill bits tend to wander um, if you start a hole with that, especially if it's a large bit. It'll tend to walk all over the place and won't be as accurate. So here I'm on the drill press. I think I have a 3 16 drill bit and I'm pre-drilling a bunch of holes where all those frame members are going to line up. And these are the pocket holes that are going to go on the main frame members with the dowels. So I'm doing a combination dowel pocket hole joint. So you can see this is how it looks when they will be attached. So it's actually a very strong joint. And here I'm just chamfering the corners with a hand plane. So this is 220 grit sandpaper and I'm just doing a light sand on these. I'm actually not sanding all the saw marks out and in fact I purposely used a dull circular saw blade on my table saw when I cut all these frame members because I want some of that circular saw texture to show on the finish. Um, just because I want it to be kind of rustic looking. I've actually never done that before for a stained finish so this is a first time for that but but I'm not sanding it down all the way I'm leaving a little bit of the rough texture just to give it some character. So here I am I'm cutting the final size for the tabletop and I'll be sanding that at the same time as the rest of the piece. I'm doing a little bit of hand planing to smooth out some of the bumps So I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is all pine throughout, and it's all local material. And I'm being careful again not to sand it too much, because I don't want it to be too smooth. I want some roughness to show. So I'm leaving some of the original mill marks from the bandsaw mill on the tabletop surface. Okay, so here is the first stage of the assembly process. I do three separate stages. I glue the short ends together and then the double X sides and then I glue all of those together in the final operation. So start from the center and work out and everything gets lined up and then pre-drilled a little bit to start the screw hole and then I sink the screw in to suck it together and that's how it goes together. So I'm using a little bit of glue and screws and that's all it takes to glue all this together and so no fasteners will show on the outside surface when it's put together so all the screw entry holes are hidden so this is a long side I start from the center portion and then I attach the X's and then work to the outside so by making a little starter hole uh, that helps to line up the part better and uh, keep it from walking around as I tighten the screw. So you can see there's a, actually a little bit of overlap there. That's because all of these frame members are a slight different size. 
Okay, so here I'm sanding the dowels that are going to join this together. And that's actually an important step because dowels are typically very tight fitting to fit the exact diameter of the hole. And if you're doing a complicated assembly with dowels, you have to make sure that your dowels are slightly undersized so that when you apply the glue, it doesn't swell up right away and, and lock into place. And sometimes that can kill an assembly project uh, and you end up having to use a lot more clamping pressure and you have to bang on it with a hammer and sometimes that can mar the surface. So as you can see, this went together without any hammering and that was what I wanted. I didn't want to you know, take too much time putting this together because it's kind of a critical operation. And uh, sanding the dowels to make them undersized is important to do here. So that's a quick tip. Um, and then after I have it together, I'll just clamp it in place and then I'll put those pocket screws in as an afterthought just to give it some more ad additional mechanical strength. So these are the final screws going in to attach all of those frame members together. Now the base is complete. I just have one final member. This is just a center support board to give the tabletop more support and to give it a place to screw down into at the center because it is a solid wood top it has to be pinned in the center and it's going to shrink and expand on the sides and so I'm cutting the biscuit slots for the tabletop fastener clips and here I'm sanding the initial stages with the belt sander And since I had all of the frame members pre-sanded to 220 grit, I actually don't have to do that much sanding on it. So I'm just doing a little bit of hand sanding and that's all I need to do to break those edges on those corners. Alright, so here we are doing some finishing. This is the first step of the walnutty pine finish. So I'm going to make this piece of pine look like walnut and what I'm applying here is not a stain it's an acid that I mixed with vinegar and steel wool and there are actually a lot of videos on YouTube showing how to make this product and apply it and it's a fairly straightforward process so I'm not inventing anything new here I'm just doing a aging patina on pine using steel wool and vinegar as a starter and this is what it looks like. It's going to darken over time as it dries. And that produces a unique effect in wood. It reacts with the tannins that are naturally occurring in wood. So it, it looks different than a stain. And the second step, I'm going to apply tea which is high in tannin content. So this is just regular black tea that's concentrated and I'm applying that to the surface and that's going to infuse more tannins into the wood and cause it to darken more. So that's the tea coat. And this X-Base actually ended up being one of the most difficult finish jobs just because of all those inside corners and angles. It was very tedious to paint by hand. So this is what it looks like after the tea coat. And it's going to dry and darken a little bit more over time. And I give it 24 hours in between coats. So this is what it looks like the next day after it's completely dry. You can see some darker areas coming through. And so what I'm applying here is an oil-based stain. I believe it's golden oak which has a high yellow pigment in it. And you can see that the color is changing drastically at this point. And typically if you're applying stain directly to bare wood 
you would use a sanding sealer or some type of sealer before you apply the stain. But in this case it goes right onto the bare wood and the previous uh, vinegar treatments, it does something to the surface so it doesn't you know, look too blotchy when it accepts the stain. Uh, so this is the third step in my finishing process to make pine look like walnut. And you can definitely see a transition at this point to look more like a finished color. So I let that stain dry for a good 48 hours and here I'm applying the first coat of polyurethane mixture. This mixture I call medium. It's a 1 to 8 ratio of polyurethane satin and a stain called Early American. Both these products are made by Minwax. And I've discussed uh, this uh, finishing process, this mixture, before. I apply it in a lot of different finishing applications. And it's a way to blend colors in uh, and give a little bit of tone without applying a lot of color all at once. I like to build up the color naturally and gradually. Um, and so here we are, I'm sanding the first coat. And because I applied water in the initial stages of this, it raised the grain up quite a bit. So I have to do quite a bit of sanding on this to get it to be smooth that first coat of polyurethane left the surface very very rough. So here it is sanded and now I'm gonna apply the second coat and I'm gonna apply it to the bottom first. So I, I did one coat of the vinegar solution on the bottom just to make sure it's even on both sides because if you apply finish on just one side only it can warp the table so I uh, applied polyurethane to the bottom side and then flipped that over. So that's going to help seal out both surfaces at the same time so that the tabletop is as stable as it can be. So this is two coats of polyurethane on here now. And on the base I just did, this is actually the final coat on the base. This is polyurethane that's flat when it dries and it doesn't have any of the stain in it. But the top is going to get an additional coat so I'm going to sand it for a second time and then apply the top coat of flat polyurethane and then this will be complete. So I did a video showing how to make flat polyurethane using typical Menwax satin and it actually works with water-based finishes and other brands as well. But I did a video on that. It's fairly simple and straightforward. So here I'm screwing down the base to the top. I start from the center. So the center screws are pinned directly into the wood. And then the clips are on off to the side. And those are going to move when the top expands and contracts. So the project is complete at this point and ready to be picked up. This is my walnutty pine finish which looks remarkably like walnut. So if you like this video with the voiceover and this is something that you'd like to see, um, just let me know your thoughts on it. If you like the music better, I know there's people who like the music.